Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome to Decoding Power, Unpacking Leadership in Arts Organizations. My name is Leandro Zanetti. I am a co-founder and partner at Evolution Management Consultants, and I'll be your host for this afternoon's conversation. Thank you for joining us, taking time out of your busy days. We're so happy to have you watching this either in real time or recorded afterward. Thank you for spending a little bit of time with us. Today's discussion is going to center around the exploration of the shift in arts leadership around the country toward more collective models of leadership. You know, Daniel and I started uh, talking about this uh, a little bit over a year ago, just a year ago. Um, and we found a lot of kismet in our conversations and understanding where each of us were coming from, um, a lot of curiosity about these models and some, um, you know, critical questions as we thought about what do we think about collective models? What does shared leadership mean? Um, and, and so we're, we're interested in diving into this trend toward more collective leadership models. And we felt like shared leadership model was so broad that it could mean any number of things. And we were moved to get to get together a panel of folks who are working in various models of collective and shared leadership to talk about, you know, um, what it is that, that they do and how power works within each of these systems. Um, you know, we're we're we'll use leadership models ranging from, you know, traditional hierarchy to a full-on democratic structure or, you know, full-on anarchy. And we're hoping that this discussion helps other organizations who are considering new leadership models. What what should they think about? What are the questions that come up as we consider shared leadership models? And you know, and and whether or not hierarchy is should still even be a part of the conversation. We'll dive into a little bit of that too. And so I am joined today by an incredible panel, and I'll let each of them introduce themselves. Uh, first, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for spending this hour with us and uh, sharing your insights and wisdom. We'll share, you know, name, pronouns, uh, where you're calling from, uh, what you, what your organization you're at, what your role is, um, one word of how you are today, and then a brief description of the leadership models that you've worked in, um, whether currently or in the past, and how long you've been working in those. So we'll give each of everybody a little bit of time. Um, Daniel, why don't you kick us off? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Park, you can use he and him pronouns for me today. I'm calling from Lenape Hooking, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, one word, I'm coming down. That We'll, we'll put in a, a hyphen in between that to turn it into one word. It's been a busy season and I finally get to slow down as things are starting to cool down here uh, a little bit in the mid-Atlantic. Um, yeah, and so I'm with Obvious Agency. I'm one of the uh, worker owners there as well as the cooperative business manager. Um, two very different jobs. We do a little bit of everything. We're a small team of four. Uh, in terms of how we kind of operate and make decisions, what leader, how leadership functions, um, broadly, we work collectively as a worker-owned cooperative. Uh, we all make the most important big decisions together. And a lot of what we're working on right now actually is getting better at delegating more and more decisions so that not everyone is doing everything and we're not dealing with the tyranny of structurelessness. Um, but that being said, I've worked in collectives before where the, you know, the formal decision making is very, very clear and how it all happens and everybody has the same amount of say in everything to you know a traditional classical hierarchy uh, and really everything in between. Um, yeah, so that's like a little bit about me just to get going. Thank you, Jacqueline. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Flores. My pronouns are she, her, ella, and I am calling in from the land of the Chumash and the Tongva, colonially known as Los Angeles. Um, I am feeling grateful today, very grateful to be in this space with everyone here and excited to learn from you all. I am the producer for the Latinx Theater Commons, which is a movement, it's a national movement that uses a commons-based approach to transform the narrative of Latine theater within the American theater. And we use a consensus-based approach to make all of our decisions. And the way we define that is that not everybody agrees, but everybody agrees to move forward. Um, so everybody is okay with the decisions that are being made and trust that the group uh, is making the decision that is best for our, like, continuing to move our mission forward. And that's the way the LTC has operated for 11 years now. 
Awesome. Thank you. Linson? Hey, everyone. I'm Lansing Fu. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm calling in from Lenape Hoking, uh, Manhattan, New York. I am one of four co-directors of Here Art Center. We all just started in July. <laughs> and uh, before here, I have also had other experiences in working in a two-person shared leadership model. And this is my first time working with um, a group of four of us. And we also, um, similar to what Jacqueline is saying, we work very much in a consensus model. Um, and there is no hierarchy between us. And the way that we, um, <clears throat> we think of our roles as not divided into one of us does this and one of us does this and one of us does this, but we have a very um, mixed approach to how we take on leadership and management within the organization. And everyone is involved in both the artistic leadership and the managing and um, executive producing of everything. Um, and so we kind of are feeling ourselves as, as a very like very much a, a multi-armed, uh, we keep referring to ourselves as an octopus, <laughs> like one giant brain and <laughs> many eight arms. <laughs> so that's where we are. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Nati. I love that because I've also been using the octopus metaphor lately. Um, so that's amazing. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Leandro and Daniel and Hal Round. It's so good to be here with you all. And, and just thank you for creating these spaces for this kind of conversation and learning. Um, I've already learned so much hearing from you all. So my name is Nati. I go by she, her, mommy. And I'm on Paiute, Shoshone, Goshut, Ute lands, currently in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, but I'm originally from New York. Feel like I had to say that. Um, born to immigrants from Cuba and the Caribbean coast of Colombia, who landed in Queens in the mid 1960s. So I'm New York Latino to the full, and I'm the co-founder of an organization called Art Co-op. Um, I work in the realm of communications organizing, artist organizing, and consider myself kind of like a switchboard weaver, connecting worlds between economic justice movements, cooperative movements, where I met Daniel, um, and the solidarity economy movement, which I can share more about later, and the world of arts and culture, which is still, there's a huge gap between these worlds um, that art.coop works to fill. Um, so we're three years old. We were born out of a report that we I wrote with um, my co-founder, Caroline Willard, for grant makers in the arts, which is I, uh, the National Association of Private and Public Funders, uh, who wanted to learn about new economy, alternative economies in the wake of all the George Floyd uprisings, where a lot of institutions were asking these questions around root causes to what we were seeing out there. And that resulted in a report we wrote called Solidarity Not Charity, Arts and Culture Grant Making in the Solidarity Economy, where we kind of introduced the arts philanthropy world a little bit more into these alternative economic models, shared leadership examples um, that were on the ground of artists and culture workers who were involved um, in these kind of solidarity economy practices. And yeah, the report is about the ways in which arts and culture grant makers can uh, engage in systems change work that ad addresses root causes of inequality rather than the symptoms. There's a lot more I can say, but I came to this work because I worked at the New Economy Coalition for six years, which was my introduction to this idea of new economy, solidarity economy. I was aware of like the Black Panthers and the Zapatista and like movements out of Brazil. And I knew that in Europe, there was more funding for the arts, for example, at the state level. But I didn't know that there were people on the ground in the United States, like working on these solutions. So that was eye opening for me as a as someone who had come from the music industry, where I worked for over 10 years in the live um, music industry. And as a woman of color in that industry, as you can see right now with all the accusations with Puff Daddy, right? Like the domination that has gone on in our culture industry, I experienced experienced that. And luckily, I'm married to an economist who uh, I could ask these questions about of like, why is there all this exploitation, this fake it till you make it this like a band I got on Coachella, and like, we can't pay our rent this month, like, why is this? Um, and so this experience of working at NEC and seeing these groups working on new economic models, 
and my lived experience of the exploitation I experienced um, kind of led me to building art.coop with Caroline. And I mentioned NEC because we went from a very traditional top-down nonprofit where our ED was making like double more than any of us were making, which is hilarious because we were the new economy coalition. <laughs> um, to like in the span of like, I would say three to five years going through this like messy, long, but ultimately very satisfying process of becoming something, it's a mouthful, but it's called a worker self-directed nonprofit, uh, which comes out of the work of um, the Sustainable Economies Law Center, who was an NEC member. Um, and they do a lot of work and they hold cohorts um, to kind of help people and organizations reorient around what it is like to actually have a nonprofit that the workers are self-directing. And so I had that experience at NEC and left in 2022 and didn't get to really appreciate all of like the, the gifts from that even because it was such a messy process, but now I'm still very uh, close and in touch with folks at NEC and like can see how that kind of messy foundational work has translated into a much more democratic staff. And I would even say because it's a network, it has like trickled down into like the membership also has like a lot of say in the priorities of the network. And, you know, it's not perfect. It's not the silver bullet, but I literally experienced like going from a pretty ineffective nonprofit that didn't walk our talk to like a struggling, but way more uh, equitable, um, you know, empowering, I would say, um, place of work. Um, that then like the members, like the people that we serve then also got to benefit from that as well. And I'm seeing that even today. And I know I'm going long, but that experience also, um, you know, kind of translated to my work at art.coop, which is, which I mentioned earlier, we're trying to fill this gap, right, between cooperative movement, solidarity economy, and the arts and culture philanthropy field first, which it wouldn't have been my choice, but that's who sent the RFP out wanting to learn about this stuff. So that's kind of the roots of our organization. <laughs> um, and so Caroline and I felt extremely, um, like that it was important to us to really struggle with um, being a collective. And like, we're not formally a cooperative. We mm -hmm. aim eventually to be a multi-stakeholder cooperative. Um, but, you know, we do make all, all our decisions um, consent based. And if we, uh, if we, well, consensus, and we have promised to each other that if we hit roadblocks around consensus, that we would try to move to more of a consent model, which was mm. already mentioned. Um, and we're a growing team. So we're, we started out as two, not trying to even be an org. Then this report made a splash and then we kind of grew and then we kind of stumbled through that. Uh, you know, the hierarchy, the, the, the everybody doing everything, right? Kind of what Daniel talked about. We struggled through that, like, oh God, we can't do that. So, and now we're a team of nine part-time and full-time not everybody's full-time so i can share with you all a, bit, a little bit later like our um our org uh structure if you want we work kind of in a sociocracy model where we have an operations circle and we have like a program circle and then two representatives from each of those circles have a, our our general circle mm -hmm. and uh, we made we made a really big decision also to invest in our operations that's why we've grown because um, we're kind of doers and weavers and program people. And we were finding like, we were really failing on the like foundation around like taking care of ourselves, not overworking, um, these kind of things. So, so that's a little bit, a long winded way of, of, of how we, I got to this shared leadership model at art.coop from my work at new economy coalition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. And I mean, amazing wisdom here today, y'all. Uh, you know, we've got people who are founded under uh, under collective leadership models. We've have people who have transitioned from more hierarchical models, and so I'm I'm excited about the the conversation that can happen between those two things. And uh, you know, because I don't believe in asking people to do anything I won't do, uh, I'll also just do a quick introduction. My name is Leandro Zanetti. I use he him his pronouns. I'm from Evolution Management Consultants, where I'm a co-founder and partner, as I said. Um, I am feeling uh, hopeful today, uh, and 
you know, in, in the times that we're in, sometimes that's rare. So I'm basking in it. Um, and uh, actually EMC is also a collective leadership model. I am one of three uh, partners and uh, co-owners on uh, EMC, I'm uh, joined by my colleagues, Al Hartley and Tiffany Vega. And we've been operating for about two years in this collective model where all three of us, there is no hierarchy between us. We are all equal owners. And we all have equal say in any decision that our organization makes. Um, and so uh, thank you, thank you for, for being here. And let's dive in, you know, the title of, of today is Decoding Power. And in our brief uh, conversation right before this, Daniel mentioned that we're having this conversation in the midst, two weeks away from election uh, night and uh, go vote. If you haven't voted, early voting has started, at least in Atlanta. Um, and so if you can vote, go vote. And, uh, you know, but we're, as we start to think about the leadership of this country moving forward. I feel very honored to be in, in conversation thinking about new and better ways of doing it with all of you. And um, I wanna start with the topic of power, right? That That's where our title is. And when you, th there's perhaps a, um, I'll start with my opinion. My opinion is that not all shared leadership models necessarily contend with or disrupt power dynamics, right? You it, you can very easily put shared leadership on top of um, existing shared uh, power dynamics. And one of my fears is that we continue to think of power as something that exclusively lives at the top. Right, that that that's the people who have power, and that that in if we continue that sort of train of thought, that means we just have to add more people to the top, and then we fix the problem. Right? No, in my opinion. Um, and so I'm I'm curious, you know, in the in the structures that you all have worked, how do you think about power? How do you assess power within the organization, or how do you map it? Where does power come into the discussions? around how you um, operate in collective leadership. I'll jump in first. So I'm going to really focus. Well, OK. I guess the, I'm, I'm sort of drawn, right? Because I'm thinking first about formal power and then secondly about like soft power, right? Or like more like social constructs of power, social, uh, social identifiers and how those then impact how power actually flows into practice. With obvious agency, right, we work primarily through a consensus model. And by consensus here, what I mean is everyone has to agree. Right. Sometimes we turn that into consent, by which I mean there just need to be no like major concerns of harm and then a, a thing can still move forward. Right. That's pretty radical, especially like for us, especially considering we're all artists who are running the company as well. Right. It's not that uh, all of us contribute both to the administrative and the artistic life of the company. We don't necessarily do that in equal measure for all things, but we have ways of compensating for that and we have uh, systems within how we make decisions to compensate that for that as well, right? But as a worker-owned cooperative, the basic idea that we're running through is that the people who are working for the business should be the people who are owning the business, are the people who should be benefiting from the business, and who should be making the highest level decisions around that business. And as I was talking about before, there are things where I'm like, it gets to a point when we got to a size where it was like, I don't want to have a say in that. I have way too many other things on my plate. Like, I don't care about our marketing. I'm not not good at that. That's like not my skill set. I don't care what we post on Instagram. I don't need to know what the content is. Like, I just, I don't, please don't involve me in that. I would much rather focus on the things and put my energy towards the stuff that I care about, right? So there are ways in which we very intentionally decide where are the decisions where we all need to have a say in this because we're all meaningfully impacted by it? Where are the decisions where actually that can be delegated to the person who's really doing that work or the person who's most impacted by it or simply the person who cares about having a say in that kind of decision? Um, and so ultimately coming back to this question of like, well, why should anyone have a say 
in the decision that is getting made? Is it simply because they are at sort of like the top of the management food chain and they're the person who's supposed to be overseeing everything else? Is it because they're actually involved in the day-to-day -day work of the thing and how it's happening and why? Is it because they are sort of like financially responsible for the well-being of the organization? And so, right, there are all of these different ways that we can look at it and ask that question. Um, but yeah, for us, it's really just about this idea of like, we thought artists should have more say in their working conditions generally. Uh, uh, and and this was one way for us to, to do that. And so it's really similar to like a traditional ensemble uh, uh, way of, of creating and of working together. We just put a formal structure around it so that we were also interrupting some of those social dynamics that get in the way. Uh, where it's like, yeah, if you don't talk about how uh, privilege, how identity, how socialization come into this and adjust for those things in the ways that you go about making decisions, then that cultural stuff is going to eat whatever policies that you put into place, ultimately. Thanks, Daniel. So I'm curious for those of you who are working in, in these consensus models, how power, how that influences or affects power within those organizations. I'm happy to jump in. Um, I will say, so one thing I didn't say in my introduction is the Latinx Theater Commons is volunteer led. We have a steering committee that um, leads and decides on our programming and moves our programming forward. And then there's a producer, which is myself, but my role isn't like an executive director where the, the like I make decisions. I um, always say like I facilitate conversations and I help bring the, the programming to fruition alongside the steering uh, committee and the way it works at least like in an ideal is um, everybody has equal power everybody comes into the room and like titles go out the window like when you come uh to steering committee meetings when you're part of our programming committees to do um, the events we have coming up. It, you know, it doesn't matter that you're an artistic director at X company. It doesn't matter that you're a professor of theater at X university or that you just graduated from undergrad. Like everybody has, um, everybody has the same, uh, I don't know the word, uh, but you, you understand what I'm saying. It, I'm not naive to like, I understand that regardless of that thought process, like when people show up in rooms, they still bring their positional power. You know, like if I'm in a room with somebody who is 30 years my senior, I might not be comfortable speaking up. So it's definitely not like a perfect system by any means. Um, and we try to like engage people and, and, make space, take space um, type of thing in all of our meetings. But I will say that I've I've seen it happen in meetings where people who do have positional power at other organizations end up like taking up more space than others. And then you'll see other people who are maybe um, newer in the field, younger, suddenly like you'll, you'll see their idea shift to like, oh, you're Actually, I, I think you're right in that. And it's it's just, it's hard because I want to be like, no, you tell me your idea. Like you don't have to then just agree with what somebody else is saying. Um, so it it's not perfect all the time, but we definitely try to level um, the playing field. And um when it comes to like making decisions, like I said before, like it's all consensus based. And unlike Daniel, for us, it's like not everyone has to agree. We just have to agree to move forward. But it's similar to what you were saying about consent of like every like as long as nobody is like this goes against LTC mission, this is harmful. Like we can move, you know, we can move forward. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I guess to piggyback, oh, do you want to go back? You want to go? No. You gonna, 
I got it. Okay. Well, to piggyback off that, I, I have experiences at NEC when, when there was someone that was against a proposal, let's say, built into the process was, well, if you're against the process, you have to, within a week, like develop a new proposal that then you bring to the team. So I've I think that that is a way to kind of empower people that may not consent to kind of be creative in the ways that they want to propose to the um, the rest of the group of how, how we want to move forward. So mm -hmm. that has been, because then it's not just like you're blocking for blocking sake, because maybe maybe there's a personal thing going on on the staff or maybe there's, a, you know, which that comes into this sometimes, but it's like, no, well, you're consent, you're saying, no, you don't want to move on this proposal. Well, then you have to draft another proposal that then you can bring to the group. And then the group has to kind of um, decide between those proposals, which I think is a really interesting way of um, just kind of spreading power and, um, but I also, with this question, I think about what the the different organizations that, that like who these organizations serve. Like for New Economy Coalition, it's a it's a membership based org, um, right? So that's always like who the organization is in service to. With Art Co op, we're in this like murky period where we're like who. Who do we actually serve? Because we've done a little bit of like philanthropy work and built into that is this inherent connection to power that our org has um, because we literally wrote a report for the philanthropy world. So we ourselves are trying to deconstruct that as a staff of, by getting extremely clear about who we're, we're serving. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like in this discussion, it's important to talk about that because it might be an ensemble that's trying to serve the greater artistic good that you're trying to express, right? Which, you know, then this question is very different or it might be kind of how Daniel asked it, which was like, you're trying to get a business off the ground, right? Which is very different from like creating a nonprofit that isn't like top down, stale and ineffective. Um, so when I, I approach this question, I'm like, well, we all kind of are bringing different audiences and things that we um, serve. But one way within art.coop, we have a dynamic, which I kind of spoke to, which is that we have us, Caroline and I as co-founders, you know, we're really like cognizant of that, of like kind of the power that comes with that inherently of like bearing birth to a thing, like it would be very easy in a traditional, uh, I would say cultural organization, right? We see that a lot where it's like, ah, oh, the founder, right? It's like they get lionized as this like, oh, holy being that knows like the direction of the org. And we have to like push back on that sometimes, <laughs> um, Caroline and I, and the way that we've tried to do that holistically is to kind of, yeah, just bring people in who, it's very like organic. It's like, oh, we, we've done a thing and we'll meet someone and like they had, they did great work. And so then, yeah, do you want to like do this with us? <laughs> and we're kind of stumbling our way through, like trying to figure out how it can be more equitable amongst the three of us where it's not Caroline and I kind of directing everything. But I've always been really clear that I learn a lot from the person that's 10 years younger than me you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and we respect that by having equitable pay. Um, and now that has been sometimes a point of contention where there are those who have put in 20 years of experience and, you know, have those contacts. And, you know, I'm not going to say that I don't feel that way sometimes too, or I'm like, oh, I'm introducing this 26 year old to a contact I've known for like 10 years. And I really have to do my own work around, all right, why, where is that coming from? And like, mm. if I... What is the, you know, because I also come from the music industry where that was like a thing, like you hoard your relodex, you do. So I've had to do my own kind of cultural work and something I want to bring up that's been really helpful because I came from the solidarity economy movement is that there's been this incredible um, project put on by a lot of elders in the solidarity economy space that we're seeing kind of this word kind of get bastardized. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe we were a part of that too, as our doc co-op introducing these terms to philanthropy without them really doing the work of what that means. And so I've been, and we warned about that in the report, by the way, we said, don't let this become a buzzword that y'all just throw around because you want to seem like you're doing things differently. Like you need to actually do things differently. Um, and so I'm really thankful to this group of like, 
not arts people, but they're solidarity economy practitioner people who are in their 40s, 50s, who've been doing this for a long time, who bring a certain like purity sometimes to it, but they created this project called Solidarity Economy Principles, where they went and they went around to different groups and they created these principles where, um, and now we're in a community of practice with other groups that, and it doesn't mean that you need to adhere to every principle perfectly, but if you're gonna say that you're a Solidarity Economy or organization that's trying to push solidarity economy, more equitable ways of working both inside and outside, you need to make an honest attempt to adhere to these principles. Mm -hmm. So that's something that has been very helpful, I'll say, for our group of like, all right, we have these guideposts and like we're not perfect, um, but we're invested in trying to practice these principles, right? So even when I have a sense of like, it will be much easier for me to just make this decision because I know this person and I come from you, it's just easier to do that. I actually find that there are some gifts later on in like slowing down and bringing everybody on board who needs to be part of a decision. And then afterwards I can be like, wow, there was some like residual gift from that. And that even though I wanted to move fast and like make the quick decision um, because we slowed down, like we adhere to this principle of like not leaving people behind, for example. Um, and so I just wanted to introduce those principles um, to folks, solidarityeconomy.org. Um, they can be a really useful way to have, um, you know, some guideposts of like where you aim to um, go. Mm. And I think that that reflects kind of the ways in which we try to slow down um, and, and like bring people along. Mm. Mm hmm um, and uh, Lansing, I I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you know, in the in in your model, how power sort of functions both within you all and then also with folks who aren't within the four. Right. And how might that sort of um, what does that look like, if you don't mind sharing? For sure. Um, and I'm going to speak a lot in draft because it's been three months on the job. Totally. So um, a lot of the things, a lot of these things are questions that we're actively asking and um, navigating, exploring right now. And I think something that is unique about here in relationship to the folks who are in the room right now is that um, there we are very much inheriting something that is a, uh, you know, a 30 year old cultural institution that was founder led the entire time. Mm -hmm. And we're stepping into that shift right now um <clears throat> and so there's a lot we've inherited uh, a 501c3 organization we've inherited like an institutional history we've inherited a staff we've inherited a season we've inherited um all of the relationships that have been built over this time and all of the assumptions and expectations that are that come with all of those relationships and so it's really fascinating actually right now to be in a place of um, discover a like discovery of what all of those things are and also what all the assumptions and expectations are. And knowing that we have a responsibility right now that is very much about like, how do we steward the things that exist in order to ensure that the people who need the things to go on, the artists who are producing work here, the staff who have jobs here, the, you know, all of the um, various like communities that are engaged with the work. How do we steward that and ensure like the literal like financial um, soundness of sustainability of the organization so that no one is, um, has the rug pulled out from under them, like the an artist, you know? Um, and how do we like do that which necessitates us engaging with existing hierarchies. Mm. We do that while we look to shift um, power dynamics within, like, within the whole organization and like between us and our like various relationships outside. And it's really interesting to notice where, like, um, for example, like it's interesting to notice where there might be i i'm not not really even thinking of anyone in in particular right now but there there have been and there might continue to be like funders and supporters who prefer a certain kind of structure 
mm-hmm. um, and actually expect us to maintain and uphold a certain kind of structure in order for them to have trust in us to offer the services that we say are part of our mission. And then it's also interesting to walk into a space in, in relationship with a new staff who um, have been working together with each other longer than we have been working with them. And, and to be like, okay, what are the, um, interesting that these are the things that you've held um, and that these are the things that you assume about what our power dynamic is going to be as like leadership um, and staff. And and I'm just, I'm giving all of that as context to say that like the way that we work right now is very much that there's not much higher, there's not hierarchy between our leadership team, but I think there is assumed and functional hierarchy within the organization still in the sense that we are the executive leaders. Mm. Um, and so like the, the like, so that refers to like ultimate decision-making, but it also refers to like ultimate um, accountability and responsibility. Um, mm-hmm. It's kind of what Daniel was saying earlier. There are, are members of our staff where it would be actually quite unfair for us <laughs> to um, put the accountability and responsibility that we have to the organization on them. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's not something that they would necessarily want in the specific ways. And so and so there are so there are these ongoing questions that we have that we're trying to like find different ways of of practicing into answers of like how do we what um what does it mean for a staff member who does not have the same fiscal responsibility that we do because no one wants that um no one like everyone is like consensually not wanting that (laughs) Um, what does it mean for that staff member to have actual input or actual like empowerment to to share um to share opinion or to share like vision for something that we're doing Mm -hmm. um and is there a way that that feel like is there a way that we can live within the the like very real hierarchy of that power dynamic and also people feel like they have a stake and a voice and and then also acknowledging like that power dynamic to some extent within the structure that we have now like the the actual like legal financial structure we have now will never go away because ultimately we are people who make decisions about where the money is spent um, largely with input, like with input from our staff, we talk to everyone very broad, like openly and transparently um, about all the budget decisions and how we pass a budget and like input from every department about what they need and all these things. But um, it's, ne- it's never not present in the room that like, we decide what the jobs are. We decide who the jobs are going to. If someone were to be let go, it would be something that we decide, right? So that's like, that's not going to go away, um, at, right in the near term future, as like a as a power dynamic that exists. So it's like kind of what Jacqueline was saying. It's like these the the harder to see dynamics of power or like positional power are are always present, and I think it's like it is a challenge to navigate. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. And so, you know, in all of your answers, I'm I'm hearing a few things. One is that at the core of what each of you are talking about, um, particularly among the folks who you share leadership with, is this concept of trust. Right. That if you're if you're working in a in a consensus or even a consent based model that you need to have trust in people's expertise you have to have trust that they are making the best decision they see for the organization and that that trust especially if you're not um if you if it's leaders who haven't led together before right different when you come in and are found something together and you already have that trust because you've built it but building taking time to build that trust feels key in any one of these, which is point number two, right? That um, often, and we tend, we remind folks, and I think this is important, that uh, collective leadership takes more time. And um, some folks panic when we say that, right? Because there's already not enough time to do all the work we have to do. And actually, um, at least what I'm hearing from you all is it 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 is about where you spend your time and focus. And perhaps a question I have is like, is that just at the beginning? This is something where that's new that we're practicing. The first time you do something new, it's always going to take more time. Um, 
And part of the structure is that it needs to take more time, right? That's purposeful to, to not these point about like taking that time is sometimes actually very useful to build the consensus, not leave people behind. But in any case, a, a real awareness of time and where folks are putting effort and energy feels like something important to consider as you're moving into or considering other leadership models. And then the third thing that I heard really strongly in that was the the need for more structure, not less, right? I think sometimes we think of collective leadership models as um, fuzzier or, or um, that, that they can happen just because they do. And actually, because we operate in capitalism and the patriarchy and white supremacy, that actually those things start to bleed into whenever we're not like vigilant about it, right? And so structures, uh, are the thing that allow us to continue to be vigilant that it doesn't sort of veer back into it. But there's this, con there's, I often hear this thing of like, oh, but if, if you go into collective leadership, then everything just sort of becomes everybody's responsibility. And then who's making what decision, et cetera. I'm seeing a lot of um, uh, reactions to that. So I'm curious about, you know, do you hear that? What What's your response when folks, when, when folks start to get into to things like that of like, this is going to take too much time or it's not going to be clear enough? How do you respond? I can offer some practices. So um, uh, I, I guess the example that I'll give uh, is for uh, um, our, the current production that Obvious Agency is working on called Space Opera. So in this project, we are actively sharing a lot of major decision-making power with the artists that we're contracting with. Obviously, we don't have to. And towards uh, Lunting's point that like ultimately uh, we as the producing body and the people who hold their contracts have the final decision if we wanted to have that. But we actually have, uh, similar to what Nati's talking about, we've kind of based our model more off of a sociocracy model for this project, where um, we have a theatrical circle, a mechanic circle, we do interactive work. So this is where like the uh, game design of the project happens. Um, uh, a um, hospitality and care circle and administration circle. And each of those is where all of our contractors are. Those circles, based on the number of people in them, elect a certain number of representatives to an executive circle. And the executive circle is actually where we have collectively landed the budget. It's where we've collectively landed on the terms of everybody's contracts. It's where we've collectively landed on the development process for the piece, which then of course informs uh, what the budget for the piece is and all of these things, right? So we're including all of our, like our contractors have a say in how much they are getting paid for this project. They have a say in where we are allocating funds for this project. And we know that different moments in that process allow for different levels of democratic practice and power sharing, right? Mm -hmm. Where uh, we've been really clear from the top, like each circle has had taken a moment to be like, okay, when we have plenty of time to make a decision, it happens this way. When we need to make a decision really quickly, mm -hmm. it happens this way, right? And, and at Obvious Agency, we're really big proponents of like broadly and for values-based reasons, we think more democracy is good and that there are versions of hierarchy that can still be democratic, right? And that hierarchy is really useful at certain times when you need to be product oriented. Hierarchy is really great. When it's time to just like get going and start making decisions and get the work done, hierarchy is really great. If you're establishing something and you're trying to get clarity on process, when you're trying to build that trust and build those relationships, more democratic or flat processes are really, really useful because it's how we, it's its for us part of how we build that trust that when we do move into the moment where one person is making decisions on behalf of everyone else, we really know that that person has not just uh, my best interests, but our best interests and the best interests of the thing that we are here working together for all mm. all together at once and so they can do that um and we got to a point where a lot of the contractors were like look you've all involved us so much this is taking a lot of time and energy and we're just contractors so like we trust you a little bit more and you can involve us a little bit less in some of these decisions and that's actually totally okay so that's kind of how we have navigated those different moments and different processes uh uh in that one particular instance at least mm. Mm. 
Yeah, I'll add to that because, I mean, Daniel, when Daniel was at the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops, uh, they have like a consulting arm. And I remember we were going through with them. Um, yeah, just that like really building in the more structure piece at the foundation is mm -hmm. is really important. And like one way that that shows up at art.coop is in the circles, like one form of like useful hierarchy is like rather than everybody having to decide on any kind of like budget line, it's like, no, in advance we've allocated, we've co-budgeted. So we've all looked at our budget together and, and got each other kind of up to speed because different people have different facility with budgets, right? So like kind of taking that time to make sure everybody can understand the budget and then we collectively decide like, okay, within the program circle, there's artist organizing and there's funder organizing. Each circle is going to have up to, let's say, I don't know what the number is right now because we're deciding it right now. Let's say $10,000 per circle to decide on your own. So mm. it's like, if there's a thing we want to do, we're empowered as the artist organizing circle to, all right, well, it's under $10,000. Does this fit our very clear goals of what this mm. org is trying to do? <laughs> right. Because we're going to be asked about that when we make the proposal, you know, when we um like share that we're doing this, like it's, it has to align with the goals of the organization, but we don't have to get everybody's consent around what we're spending money on up to a certain amount. So I feel like that is a certain way that you can like build in the hierarchy where you can be empowered to make decisions, especially if you specialize in an area, you don't have mm -hmm. to kind of spend time bringing everybody along with like, why I want to hire an influencer marketer, right? Like Daniel's going to be like, I could give two shits about an influencer marketer, <laughs> but if it's under $10,000 and like it's going along with our goals and afterwards you there's a process of evaluation, right? Like where we can like decide, like, do we want to do, was it worth to invest this amount of money into this marketing experiment? Yes or no. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're starting from a base of information. So to your point, Leandro, it does take time because like, sometimes you might do those experiments and we're like testing it out as a group and evaluating, but then like three years from now, we'll, we will have gone through that, you know, mm -hmm. and it'll be a lot, a lot quicker. So yeah, I do think there are ways in which like, kind of setting the baseline of empowering circles around spending is really helpful. And then having like an evaluation process. Like for example, I wanted to invest money into going to some gatherings this year, right? So like if I was gonna go to these gatherings, it wasn't just for my own enrichment, right? Like we have a evaluation process of like everybody that I met and then like actually speaking with the group of like, this is what I did, like ask me questions about who we met and like, what are next steps? So those are just some practices I wanted to share of like allocating monies at the circle level um, mm -hmm. and empowering people to make those decisions about spending, but then always building in an evaluation. And it's not perfect. And sometimes we don't have the time to do that, but it might be like a Slack evaluation where I like write everybody like a Slack summary of what I did or, but always with the kind of intention of bringing everybody into like what was spent and like, was it worth it um, based on our goals? Mm. And what I love, oh, Jacqueline, go ahead, please. Um, no, I love what I'm hearing from both Daniel and Nati. And I these are tools that I'm going to be implementing as well because you know, as I mentioned, the LTC is volunteer-led. So our budget is, I, based on the programming we select, I'm like, okay, this is how much this program is going to cost us. This is how much my fee is. This is how much this is. And then I bring it to them and I say, this is what I believe our budget is for the next year. You know, and they say, yes, that, that looks good. We fundraise for that. But then where I've had, like, the nuances of that is uh, sometimes I'm like, well, there's a thousand dollars in uh, supplies, but should I check with people on what supplies I can buy for myself? Like, I don't know. Um, and then the other side of that, Nati, we, we um, kind of have implemented uh, a little bit of what you're talking about of empowering people to decide on, on their spending because we have champions for each of our programs that take the lead on programming alongside me and we started implementing stipends for each of them and instead of saying your stipend is, is x money we've started being like this is this this is the amount we have for this program 
-hmm. you can choose how you allocate that. And that way, because we usually have multiple champions, if it's a champion who's like, I actually have like a stable job, I don't really need a stipend, like I'm good. And maybe they're working with somebody who doesn't have a full-time salary job and they could use more of the stipend. You know, it's like, we're using the commons-based approach to be like, you all can decide how you how you allocate those funds. I don't have to decide for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lenson, go ahead. Um, Yeah, this is all really great. And I can share a little bit of like, from the view of the view from inside a more traditional nonprofit um, there. So the way that some things that we've gotten from the outside about our um, shared leadership model is like, okay, well, who's doing the ED job? Who's doing the development director job? Which one of you is it? And we're like, no, 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 hold on. <laughs> we're all doing all of it. And they're like, what does that actually mean? And, and it does require more structure and it does require more time. And we we check in literally every day. We're constantly talking all the time. I'm probably gonna get off this call and have like 50 messages, right? So, um, <clears throat> and I think just a little point to that is that I think requiring, I think taking more time also means that like people should be supported in that time and people should be like given the resources to participate in a struck in a thing that takes more time and takes more energy and effort. Um, and I've also had this experience with contractors and other positions, Daniel, of like them being like, I'm actually like respectfully and lovingly not being paid for this. <laughs> like with trust and love, but like I'm not. <laughs> um, so I think there's that to note, but also I would say something that we're doing that I can share as a little tidbit for anyone who's working within a similar structure as we are, which is like we're doing this thing that has been really fruitful of um, making sure that there's no less than two of us who are leading any given area um, uh, within the organization or within a particular project. Um, a, so that there's redundancy so that someone can be sick and it's fine. And B, so that there's never one person who is um, kind of calling the shots on how the thousand dollars is spent or Etc. And we're also trying very hard to empower our different um, staff members to like be like, here's the pocket of money that we have all agreed is in the budget for this. Spend it how you want. It is your job to manage this over the course of the year. You don't need to ask me to buy light bulbs. Um, <laughs> that is very much the goal. And something that has come up for us in terms of internally when there's like budget um like I wouldn't even say conflict necessarily, just like something that we've landed on is like we actually all are at a place where we feel comfortable with money being allocated and decisions around money happening if we've already agreed that the people, like the two people who are managing that are the people that we trust to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing a lot of experimenting with new programming and we're doing a lot of like, we're obviously every day coming into situations where like money that we didn't think was going to have to be spent is going, it needs somehow to be spent. And those are the areas where we're like, okay, we need to have a long meeting about it and we need to take some more time and get into like consensus about it. And then the hierarchy is placed over stuff, is basically connected right now to the budget and like existing budget lines. And then it's like new budget lines. We're like, okay, we got to figure that out together. So mm -hmm. that's just like one way that we're trying to navigate that within this very traditional structure in case it's helpful for anyone out there thinking about this and shifting. Yeah, totally. Okay, um, one last quick thought that I'll I'll okay. offer, just wrapping it was like helping helping wrap some of this up is just um there's this really great I can't remember the name of it maybe Nati knows it's like a little uh, anarchist chat book that uh, is like from old folks out of Philly but the like basic idea that it kind of offered was this idea of like leadership is a quality that people ha that everyone has and that can be brought out at any given moment and you know Leandro part of why you and I wanted to talk about this was to unpack this idea of like what do we mean when we say shared leadership because it's actually just used I think particularly particularly within the arts as this like weird euphemism for power ultimately like oftentimes what we're really talking about is power and just what's what's making me really happy about this conversation is that we're really unpacking leadership more broadly to mean things like Lan Singh what you were pointing to accountability right responsibility like Jacqueline towards what you were pointing about about like relationships right and how are those relationships held and stewarded right and then also power and how are we formally and informally holding that so I just want to like loving all of how we're breaking this down yeah, agreed, agreed. And and I think um the thing that 
uh, opened my brain up a bit. And even in the ways that, that I've been thinking about it is that it's not a one, it's not an either or situation, right? That even in uh, shared leadership models, there is room for hierarchy and um, vice versa, right? Even if you are in a traditional hierarchical model, wherever you are within an organization, how can you implement shared leadership within the power that you have within any organization? And that it doesn't have to be an, an all or nothing kind of trade-off and that there are uses for each of these cases, depending on what's going on in your organization and depending on the values and the mission and who you serve, all of those things have to be sort of baked into how you think about overarching structure and then um, and then also where you deploy different structures within day-to-day -day operations. I think it's just um, not a way I've heard most people talking about this, right? We do think about it as either or, and I think what we're talking about is that both can exist together, and I think that's beautiful, right? Um, imagining, uh, to borrow from Adrienne Marie Brown, like imagining more possibilities as opposed to less, that it that it can be this collective uh, collection of of different models. So uh, we, we're coming up on time. So I want to say, uh, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. I could spend literally all day talking to you all about this. Um, and before we wrap, I want to especially thank Daniel and Obvious Agency for their collaboration and leadership in putting this panel together. Thank you, thank you. Um, Obvious a uh, Agency is amazing. Daniel, could you tell a little bit, uh, folks a little bit more about that? And I'll pull up your slide. Yeah, for sure. Um, so thank you all so much. Obvious Agency is a workaround cooperative and performance company dedicated to the creation of a more engaging, democratic, and liberatory cultural ecosystem. Part of how we do that work is th through sharing our wisdom uh, on things like uh, democratic management, solidarity economy, and workaround cooperatives. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about how you could get more shared, uh, shared leadership practices, shared power practices into your organization, um, scan that QR code, check out our website, or send me an email and reach out for a free 30-minute consultation, and we can find out if maybe we want to work together, if it might be a good fit. We'd love to help you learn how to share power, uh, no matter uh, uh, the shape of your organization. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. And <clears throat> a little bit about Evolution Management Consultants. We are a BIPOC-owned consulting company dedicated to moving nonprofits forward. We work with a lot of arts organizations, but not exclusively arts organizations. And we work in uh, realms like executive search, recruiting, strategic planning, organizational assessment, coaching. But really, we start with an ethos of how can we help you? We are expert process designers and we want to help build more equitable and anti-racist practice in um, process design, decision making, and nonprofits in general. And so if, uh, if you need any help whatsoever, feel free to contact me directly, leandro at em emcforward.com or learn more about us via the QR code on your on your screen. We also have a podcast where we talk about things like shared leadership, um, moving forward with EMC. You can find that wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, so to wrap up, thank you to our panelists for your amazing wisdom today and for sharing it with us, with me and with everybody watching. Um, and we hope that this conversation helped illuminate some of the complexity, some of the nuance, some of the opportunity exists, existent in uh, shared leadership models. And hopefully it opened your imagination to what possibilities lie ahead in terms of leadership. Have a great day and take care of yourselves, y'all. Thank you.